Thank you all for being there. So my name is Marine Las Blaise. I'm going to talk about the magnetic field in Earth and how it's generated. And obviously you may uh, hear it from my voice. I'm French, which is why I put French here. But don't, don't worry, I'm not going to speak in French. I try to speak in English. And I try to speak slowly to help for the translation. And I put some uh, Japanese text on my slides, so I hope it's correct Japanese because I don't know any Japanese or almost. And yeah, so I'm going to talk about the Earth core and the magnetic field. And when I was um, trying to think about this talk, I was wondering what people think when they hear the word magnetic field. For me, there is two things that are kind of amazing that happens on Earth and that are related to magnetic field. The first thing is that you all went hiking or you all used at least once a compass, I hope so, and we can, see, we can decide what's north and what's south on Earth because of magnetic field and because it helps us with compass be able to see which side is north, which side, which side is south, and we're not lost whenever we have a compass, at least for north or south. And the second thing is this, which is auroras. So that's a view from space of an aurora on the south pole. And this is because of the interaction between the solar winds and the Earth's atmosphere. And the reason it's only on the pole is because of the magnetic field. And that's kind of crazy to think that something that's created inside the very center of the Earth has so many implications for Earth, for the surface, for life, and for humans. And there's a couple of other um, implication for life at the surface of the Earth that you will hear about later this afternoon. And a couple of things that you may want to notice is that some animals use magnetic field to orientate themselves. Um, so turtles use magnetic field to be able to go uh, back to their original uh, place of birth. And some birds also use magnetic field to be able to travel very, very long distance. And some scientists even used, even tried to see if dogs may actually orientate themselves when they're pooping. You, you can look at the paper, I'm not going to. <laughs> and the other thing that's very important for life, um, uh, or for Earth, uh, is that the magnetic field is actually protecting Earth from solar winds. So it's protecting the Earth from the um, uh, charged particles that are generated at this, uh, on the sun and that are propulsing over the Earth. And without magnetic field, the Earth would be uh, radiating, would, would receive radiation from solar winds, and most of our telecommunication would not be working now because of uh, this um, um, uh, charged particles. So magnetic field is something that's very important for life, has been important for life for a very long time, and is important for humans now. So when you look at other planets, you could also wonder do they have also a magnetic field? And is it something that only for Earth or is it for all planets that we know? And so here is a view of our solar system with the sun here. That's obviously not to scale. And you have um, Mercury, Venus, the Earth, Mars, which are the so-called rocky planets because their uh, composition is very close to the Earth's composition, so it's basically rocks. And there is a very thin atmosphere, but we, we can have a surface that where we can actually stand on. And this is the four gas giant planets. And there have been a couple of uh, missions and observation of magnetic field inside the solar system. And actually, most of the planets in our solar system have a magnetic field. So all of the uh, gas giant present magnetic field for which the generation is slightly different uh, from uh, the rocky planets. But even amongst the rocky planets, Mercury and Earth have a magnetic field now. And Mars had evidence that there was a magnetic field in the past. For Venus, it's a little bit more tricky. And everything related to Venus is usually more tricky. but 
there is no magnetic field on Venus now, and we don't know if Venus had a magnetic field in the past. It's quite interesting to see that the magnetic field is something that looks like kind of universal uh, for rocky planets and for planets in the solar system, but at least for Earth, we can observe it, and we can have very good observations. So we can try to look at short, scale, uh, short time scale and long time scale evolution uh, of the magnetic field on Earth. We can do ground observations, so we can look at um, evolution of the magnetic field today from ground observation and from space observations, and both of them will give us uh, different information. But for rocks, what's also very interesting is that magnetic field can be recorded in rocks. So when a rock is formed, when it reaches a certain temperature, some minerals will record the magnetic field as it was when it was formed. And so we know that the magnetic field is something that has been present on Earth for a very long time. And there have been evolution of the magnetic field, but basically the global intensity of magnetic field has been um, stable over most of Earth's history. So the magnetic field is something ancient and something that's still going on right now. And where does it come from? So this is the Earth. And magnetic field is something we see at the surface, but it comes from the very deep interior. You may have seen this figure in the past. You've seen it once in Raman's talk, and it's a figure of the uh, structure of the Earth. So now we're standing on the crust. So we're standing on some rocks, and below us uh, there is 6,000 kilometers be uh, between us and the very center of the Earth, and this is what's between us here and the center of the Earth. First, so we're in Japan, so it's very, maybe different from other places, but we're on a subduction zone, which means that we're actually, if you want to go from here towards the center of the Earth, you're actually going to cross a couple of crusts because we, are, we have subductions. And then you'll go through the mantle, which is also made of rocks. And once you reach, the core mantle boundary, you'll actually reach a big sphere of iron that's at the very center of our Earth, which is liquid, and there is a cent central part, which is called the inner core, that's also made of iron, that is, also, uh, that is solid. You may wonder how we know that, because we can't dig there, we can't go there, there is no, uh, space sheep or earth sheep that could go from the crust towards the core, even if some movies try to do that. So what we can do is we can actually use seismic observation to try to understand what is the structure of the earth. And in Japan, you know earthquakes, and what you may not know is that seismologists use earthquake to understand what's going on deep inside the Earth. So if you think about an earthquake somewhere on the Earth, we have seismic stations that are all over most of the continents and that are recording what's going on. So in Japan, we have earthquakes, we feel the surface waves but we have body waves that will travel inside the Earth. And so if you have an earthquake here, and you have a station here, what you will record is a wave that have been traveling from here to here through the whole mantle. And if you look at how fast this wave was traveling, you can find uh, information about the uh, seismic structure of the Earth. And if you're looking at stations here, you will actually get waves that have been travel traveling through the mantle, the core, the mantle, and back uh, at the seismic station. So that's how we can have information about uh, seismic properties of rocks at, um, uh, inside the Earth's uh, interior. And the other thing that's also well used here in LC is high pressure and high temperature experiments. So 
what people, what say, uh, scientists do is they use diamond anvil cells, which are actually very tiny diamonds. And you put a very, very, very small sample between the two apex of the diamonds and you push right here. And because this here is a very, very small surface, you actually manage to get very high pressures. So you, if you know what you think should be the composition of the core and you put it inside two diamonds, you can actually manage to see what would be the properties of material that is supposed to be at the very center of the Earth. So that's how we know, so combining these two kind of uh, observation, we know that the core is mostly liquid and is made of iron, and we have a central inner core that is, must, uh, that is solid. And this liquid outer core is where the magnetic field is generated. So let's go to how to generate a magnetic field. So what you need is you need an electrically conductive fluid, which is iron, liquid iron inside the core, and you need some energy to start pushing the, the fluid. And what's called the dynamo effect is when you start pushing a fluid, you will induce a flow this flow, because it's a flow inside an electrically conductive fluid, will induce a magnetic field. And if you choose carefully your flow, if you choose carefully the geometry of the flow, this magnetic field that was generated by flow will also induce another flow that will induce magnetic field. And you'll get a loop that will basically increase the magnetic field up to a point where you get a dynamo. So it's basically self uh, self-sustained um, uh, flow and magnetic field. But for that, you need some energy. You need some energy available to actually generate this magnetic field. So what's the energy available in the Earth that's actually driving what we call the geodynamo? So geo for Earth and dynamo for this effect. We're talking about liquid flowing. And so the density variations in a liquid will induce flows, so that's what we're usually thinking when we're thinking about driving the dynamo. So buoyancy effects are basically when you take a AV parcel of fluid and you put it in water, it will go down. So if you put milk in water, it's slightly heavier than water. So the milk will go at the bottom of your cup. Or if you have a light fluid in a um, overall fluid that's slightly heavier, it will go up. It's just because of density variation. And if you manage to get a way to get light or heavy fluids, you will induce flow, and that's what we call convection. And for example, in the ocean, it's something that's uh, very important. So you have the uh, freezing of ice at the pole that will create salty and cold water. This salty and cold water will go down and will be uh, warmed at the equator, and it will, you will get a liquid that's warm and not too salty, so it will be slightly lighter. And so this will induce an overall circulation that's called the thermo-aligned circulation that's, for example, uh, represented here, where you have a formation of deep water at the poles that will actually roll and do this kind of very, very large-scale circulation into the ocean. And in France, it's something that people are very happy about it because I don't know if you notice here, but the, there is a, a warm water coming from the equator that goes up to France, uh, to the French coast. And that actually is why we can swim here. So if you go to France and you go to the ocean, you'll actually manage to swim because the water will be not too cold. But if you go at the same place here in Canada or in the US, if you're at the same latitude, you're not going to go in the water. It's going to be way too cold. So if you want vacation, go to France. <laughs> so let's go back to the Earth. And we're looking at the outer core here. And what's actually driving density variation into the Earth? First, the Earth core is very warm. It's very hot. It has been hot since the formation of the Earth because of 
all this energy that was uh, accreted, or all this energy that was uh, uh, that summed up during the accretion, and this heat wants to go out, and the mantle is actually pumping heat from the outer core, and this induces a density variation at the top of the outer core. And the second important thing that will create density variation is the freezing of the inner core. So I told you inner core is solid. And inner core is actually made of the same uh, alloy that the outer core. But since the temperature in the core decreases, it's like ice formed in your freezer. It's freezing of the solid iron, of the liquid iron from the outer core. And so at the surface of the inner core, you will release uh, latent heat because of this freezing. And you will also release light elements because the same way the ice in the ocean has less salt than the water, then here the solid inner core is actually formed on, uh, uh, of an iron that uh, has less impurities, what we call light elements, than the global outer core. So at the surface of the inner core, you're releasing a liquid that's lighter because it has more impurities and it's also hotter. So due to this density variation, you're inducing flows inside the outer core that drives the dynamo. Here I draw this kind of flows because it's how we usually see convection. It's like nice plumes and it goes up and goes down. But for the core of the Earth, it's a lot more complicated. And the Earth's core is rotating very fastly. It's also very unviscous. And what it means, it means that the Earth's core, actually the flows inside it looks like the ocean. It looks like water. So it, see, it means that it's very turbulent. And now people manage to do simulations to actually model this kind of flows. And we get this kind of pictures and which does not look like what I to uh, showed you just before with just like nice plumes. It's very turbulent. It has lots of very small scale um, eddies and it's a lot more complicated, but that was um, simplest uh, view to see it. So here is a um, simulation of the best thing we can do to model the Earth's core, um, which is very tricky to do because of the turbulence and the highly rotating fluid. And you see uh, small circuit, like small plumes of light fluid that goes up here and heavy fluid that goes down. So that's what's actually generating the dynamo. And now there is a question of the dynamo history. So here is a simplest view of the Earth's formation. So it looks like what we see in the talks before. So you start with small planets, you build, um, you build uh, bigger planets, planetesimals and uh, protoplanets, and then the Earth. But here I showed you the structure inside. Because in green you have the mantle, in red is the core. And at first the planet is so hot that there is no inner core. But for now, we think that the inner core is driving the dynamo. The inner core crystallization is driving the dynamo. So a big question now for research is trying to understand what was happening before the inner core first crystal. So before we had any inner core, how can we still have a dynamo? People here in LC are working on a different hypothesis. Uh, one of the main ones recently has been the publication of uh, SiO2 crystallization inside the Earth core, which is basically instead of crystallizing the inner core, which is um, dense, solid, uh, made mostly of iron, you would crystallize something that's very light that will go up and goes up to the core mantle boundary. But I think now, What's interesting is that we can also have a look at other planets. And so another thing we're thinking here at LC is trying to see what is universal in planetary dynamos and can we actually try to understand better the Earth and the Earth's magnetic field by looking at other planets and even at looking at other exoplanets, so outside the solar system. Thank you.